I guess it's a, it's officially my job to let you guys know we are live. I <laughs> told them. I told them. Uh, uh, well, let me let me start by saying thank you, you guys, very much for coming on tonight, for joining in this virtual conversation, and for all of our viewers or listeners out there in internet land, we want to thank you for logging on, and on behalf of the Georgia Firefighters Burn Foundation, we want to say welcome to this conversation. And tonight, we're going to get into a conversation about children's burn camp. And some may ask, what the heck is that? And hopefully by the end of this conversation, people will have a better idea of what a burn camp is for children and why it's important, what it looks like, and just encourage some people that they know someone who could benefit from a resource or a program like this, they'll log in to either the Byrne Foundation or any of the other agencies that are on here. And we're gonna get started with some introductions. And I'm Dennis Gard, the Executive Director of the Georgia Firefighters Burn Foundation. And on behalf of the Board of Directors and those we serve, we welcome you. And I want you guys to do some self introductions, and I'm just so excited because we've got some heavy hitters on here this evening, with, uh, which is pretty cool. But I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch it off to you, uh, Mackenzie. Thanks, Dennis. Good evening, everybody. I'm hoping my internet connection will stay strong for this conversation. If not, I'll relocate and be with you. Um, I work with Dennis at the Georgia Firefighters Burn Foundation, and I'm just so excited to have this group of people that I feel um, like I can call friends after all this time. Uh, mentors, all sorts of people. So we're really excited to have, um, there's a lot of, I don't wanna call, nobody's old here, but I think this collective group, if we added up the years of camp experience, we'd be pushing, uh, we'd be pushing a few digits there. So um, we're just really excited to have y'all. And Anita, if you wanna go next, I'll pass it off to you. Before Anita Thank goes, you. I just, very, very interesting that the baby of the group uh, would mention the amount of uh, experience on this. I don't think I'm the baby. Oh, Am I? I don't know. I think Daniel. I think I'm older than Daniel, but not. No, okay, you're older than me. Well, a couple of months. <laughs> okay, I'm the baby. That's baby. <laughs> Look, I, I am proud to say I'm old, so that's okay. <laughs> that just means there's a lot of experience there. Um, I'm Anita Fields, and I am coming from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And um, here we um, have Camp Celebrate, which started in October of 1982. So we're getting ready to celebrate our 40th birthday. Wow. So we're excited. So we're, you know, 40 years of burn camp in, in the United States. So that's something to celebrate. Great, great. We, we celebrate with you. Uh, I know you do. Yes, yes. Uh, El Presidente, of, I mean, Daniel. <laughs> oh, uh, my name is Daniel Chacon, and I'm uh, out in California. I'm with the Elise and Rich Burn Foundation. I'm the exec director out here. Um, and uh, I will also add on to Anita's to say not only 40 years, but the first burn camp ever done. So I think that is a huge thing to hang your hat on to, to have that as an accomplishment, not only just 40 years, but 40 years of an amazing burn camp is what I hear. So um, I... I can only strive to, to get that wisdom and that expertise as Anita and some of my fellow panelist friends have here. Um, uh, I, our camp out in California, we do multiple different kinds of camps. Uh, our kids camp though is uh, celebrating our 37th year this year, um, 36 and a half. Really, we, we didn't count the COVID year uh, as we all had to go virtual, but uh, technically this would be our 37th. And we are uh, one of the larger camps out there. So I have about 150 kids that come out and less than um, less than a month from now. So it is crunch time for me to say the least when it comes to the camp uh, period. Yes. yes. Ours is in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, 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 wrap, we'll wrap this part up with uh, <laughs> this to a crescendo uh, with Cindy. 
So um, good evening and welcome to everybody. I'm Cindy Rudder and I'm also in California. I'm in Southern California though, which is much nicer than Northern California, if I say so <laughs> myself. Um, I've been involved in <laughs> I've been involved in burn camps since 1992 and started out in Arizona at the burn camp, San Diego burn camp, the Elise Anne Rouge, and still doing camp with the International Association of Firefighters, their camp. Um, and we'll be celebrating 25 years with them this year is their 25th anniversary. And um, I, I love burn camp. I, I just think it's the best thing. And it's a great topic for us to talk about tonight. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is great. And I was remiss in saying the Georgia Firefighters Burn Foundation is celebrating 40 years of existence this year as well. And Great. we're really uh, proud to be a part of this, this legacy of this history. And the mission of the Georgia Firefighters Burn Foundation is to partner with the fire service and burn care community to provide fire safety and prevention education, support medical facilities, and assist burn survivors in their recovery. When we say assist burn survivors in their journey of recovery, because it really is a journey. And uh, that last part, assisting burn survivors in their journey of recovery, uh, burn camp plays such an important role with that. And, and I want us to have a conversation, but I want to have a conversation in a way uh, because we're all familiar with burn camp. We love it. We understand it. But I want to have a conversation for that person who may be listening, who've never heard of a burn camp, who don't know what it is, why it's important, and what, what it looks like. Um, and, and, and with that, what is burn camp? What, 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 what is burn camp? Uh, and we want this to be very informal and, and just conversational. Um, so what, what is Burn Camp? And we're encouraging people to send in comments and questions. And uh, I know that everyone here, I took the liberty to know that everyone here is very okay. Uh, welcome any kind of uh, questions that come in. But uh, whoever wants to start can start. What is Burn Camp? What, what is it? You know, it's great that you asked that question to start with because when, um, when we started our camp in 1982, it was for a weekend. And there was a lot of um, discussion because they said because we weren't a week and all of this kind of thing that we technically were not a camp. So this was really a, um, for us, it was an issue because we knew that we were having camp. The kids stayed overnight. They have counselors. You know, we just had all the programmatic things that just didn't last an entire week. Um, so I think that for us and the way that our camp even got started was um, we had a recreation therapist here in our burn center who had grown up going to camp and had really uh, grown up in a real camping family and knew the benefits of camp for children, period. Um, so when she had tried, to, there were a couple kids in our unit, when she tried to get these kids into a camp, the fact that they were burned scared the traditional residential camp programs. And so mm -hmm. the only way she could get these kids into camp was to um, agree to go with them every day to drive back and forth because the camp itself was not um confident that they could meet the needs of burn kids so um that started the conversation of you know well camp was important but what was also important was for these kids to be with other kids who had been burned so um so her name is dr deb walls um she's now dr deb walls rosenstein but she said okay so she said you know she just didn't want to deal with that anymore so she said well we'll just have our own camp and so our first camp started with 12 kids and um you know they had a weekend where they came together they played traditional games they got to just see other kids who had burn scars or, you know, and families got to see other kids when they brought their kids to camp. 
but they did traditional camp activities and they had opportunities where they could sit with the kids and talk if they wanted to, um, you know, about how they were feeling or whatever. And um, it was, you know, that was how our camp was born. But now, 40 years later, I could tell you endless stories about parents who have brought their kids to camp wearing long pants and long sleeve shirts. And after just 48 hours being at camp, their parents come to pick them up and they've been swimming and they've got their shorts on and their, their parents just get all choked up and say, thank you for giving me my child back. And even our kids will tell you how much it means for them to be with other kids who have been burned because they tell us that um, coming to camp is so important because it's the one place that they feel like they can truly be themselves with their burn scars and knowing that everybody else understands and it's where they truly feel the safest. Uh, you know, and, and I want to put it to the panel, why is, why is that a place that's safe? And why is it even important when you say that other kids were, were, were scared of, of them? And because if a kid is burned, can't he just go to Boy Scouts or Girl Scout camp? I think a lot of, I think a lot of kids do go to other camps with burn scars, but I think what they, it's kind of like going to school. If you go to school and you're the only kid that has burn scars, you feel like the other kids don't understand. And so I think when kids come to camp, they feel like not just the kids, we've been doing camp long enough that a lot of our counselors are burn survivors and are very visibly scarred. And it get, just gives them greater motivation to go out and, and do things. But I think it's because they see other people who they feel are like them and they're having a good time and they're not ashamed to show their scars. And it just helps give them confidence to see other people. It's like, you know, it gives them hope that they have some normalcy um, when they leave camp. Now, are we talking just the burn kids? I want to pitch this one to McKenzie. Are we talking just the burn kids or other kids in the family as well? So I, I want to make sure I understand your question. So for the Burn Foundation, I think for like the other organizations, because I know a fair bit about the work that you do, um, your work is inclusive of the whole family and the experience as well. And so um, I'm reminded kind of listening to this conversation and reflecting, there's a quote to me that kind of sums up what camp and kind of that community is. C.S. Lewis has a pretty famous quote and it's talking about friendship, but I think it kind of applies here. And I think you guys have probably all heard this quote, but to me, it's just really meaningful. And I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it. But it just says friendship is born at the moment that one person says to another, what you two, I thought that it was no one but myself. And I think like that is really speaks to the power of what for us talking about specialty camps, you know, you can fill in the blank of the, whatever that thing is, that kind of uniting force. And for us is a burn injury. And I think that that, um, is really the power of what camp provides is that moment of saying like, oh, it's not just me. And and I think that for me personally, I found camp as a volunteer, as not a person who had a burn injury, but I just found that community to be so intoxicating. That's why I kept volunteering because there were so many things I really identified in as just somebody who remembers being a young teenage girl feeling insecure about myself. And I didn't have that injury, but there was just so much that I identified about like learning to love yourself and some of these themes and things that now you know, people talk about a lot more, but when I was growing up, we didn't, that wasn't really a conversation. I mean, you had it, but not really. So to kind of, sorry to to take a, a long way home, but I think for me um, and for us at the Burn Foundation, I know for, you know, the rest of you guys, we really see it as kind of a whole family healing experience. And um, I think that that is, it starts with camp, but it also, you know, turns into other programs and kind of, you know, paves the way for some of those other conversations 
Um, and, you know, we, we do it like, our, you know, our tagline is fun with a purpose. And that really, I think, to me, sums it up is that you could go to a traditional camp, you could go to any other things that have another focus. But for us, it's really figuring out how do we use that time wisely, because we do know camp is just a week and all our kids are going back into a world who may not you know, Dennis, I've heard you say it a million times, like you didn't see any other people like you, you didn't, you know, identify, you identified in other places, but for this thing, you just, there was no place that you could identify, um, growing up. And I think, you know, we all hope that kids find that at camp. And then, you know, like I tell our kids camp is wherever you are, you know, and take that with them. And really, you know, if they have to be the one to engage in those conversations, let's give them the tools to, you know, or if they have to be the one to find safe spaces like let's help them do that so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would love to add on to a few of these points that you have made already the american camping association did research uh, back in 1998 that talked about why people should go to camp and what was the benefits of going to summer camps and what they found in their research um, was that camp did four things it increased people's self-confidence and self-esteem it provided a safe place. It was a way for people to make new friends and it was a way to offer new fun activities. The odd thing is, is maybe five years ago, Dr. Ruth Rimmer and I did a similar research asking the kids to tell us in their own words why they wanted to come to camp. And what we were able to find within her study was the reasons why kids come to burn camp, it's to make new friends, because it's a safe place and because it allows them uh, to build their self-confidence in how they see themselves, which is just indicative. These are the words of the burn survivors themselves, the same why they come to camp. So to your point, Dennis, you can, anyone can find healing, whether it be at a regular camp or a burn camp. But what we do at a burn camp is we knock down some of those levels um, and those hardships to get people to get to that place faster. No one's going to help a kid with self-esteem better than someone who's already gone through it and who already has lived experience through that. No one's going to be able to build that relationship and that rapport better than someone who's also has a very similar upbringing. So I think a lot of what we do at Burn Camp is the same work that's done at other camps, but I just think the way that we are able to break down some of the walls and barriers to get to those places is a lot faster. Uh, speaking as someone who is a person of color and where in California, Hispanic, Asian, Black communities don't go to burn camp. So really, there's a lot within that that like we are showing them that they're not going to get at these camps because they would never go to camp. But they probably will come to a burn camp now and they'll probably get those life skills, get those um, things that they're needing that they could benefit from at a burn camp then versus going to a regular camp because otherwise, if they weren't burned, they probably would have never experienced a camp format. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and Cindy, uh, you could speak to this because I, I don't want to assume that people know that the injury ends at discharge, <laughs> you know, because we're talking about aftercare and the journey. Uh, and I think it's easy to believe that when you go in the hospital, you're having to deal with something, an illness, an injury, whatever. But when you discharge, that means you're fixed. And everything gets back to normal. And you being someone who grew up with a burn injury like myself, burned as, as a child. And I'm not even sure if burn camps existed, if my mom would have let me go <laughs> because she was so overprotective. Um, and, 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 I, and I'd like for you as a, a professional, but also as someone with a experience to kind of talk about um, the value it could have brought to you you because you didn't have it well I didn't have burn camp but ironically I did go to a camp um, as a young girl and I remember it being a struggle just because it was a group of people that every year it was a different group and nobody else was burned so I was the only kid there that was burned and so it was difficult um I'm not going to say that I didn't learn from it because there was a lot of good things that I did take away from it. But back that many years ago, because it's been a while, um, there got was. Huh? <laughs> What'd you say? We've got electricity now. <laughs> yeah, we have electricity now. 
Um, there, you know, there wasn't any emphasis put on building self-confidence or giving us tools when we left camp that, you know, would benefit us back in our daily lives. And I think that's the big difference. And I, let me just back up though. I do want to say when you talk about um, the burn injury and being healed, my mindset has always been the roller coaster ride begins the day you leave the burn unit. And that's, you know, the beginning of your journey, really. The, and that journey is lifelong. I mean, that's, it's going to be an ongoing thing for the rest of your life. But I think with our kids going to burn camp, we do help them with self confidence, but we also give them the tools when they come back to their communities to give them the power that, that they need to keep going and to do what they need to do. But the other thing is I think in the friendships that they make at camp, and I'm sure all of us can attest to this because we've all been involved for a while, the kids that have grown up in camp, they have a group of friends that they're still friends with outside of camp. And we do a reunion here at my house once a year or once every couple of years we do a barbecue and it's just fabulous to listen to them, talk to each other, talk. And they talk about camp a lot, you know, that how much it benefited them and the good and the things that they learned from it. Although they'll also tell you, because at our camp in San Diego, we did circle time where technically it was like a support group, but we didn't call it that. But they, they will tell you that, they didn't like it at the time, but they're so grateful now that they had it because it, it benefited them in many ways. So I think, you know, as Daniel and Anita and Mackenzie all have spoken to, there are things that you get from burn camp that maybe you could get at a regular camp, but I don't think it has the same impact because you're sharing it with people that have a like experience. And that makes a huge difference as far as I'm concerned. And, and, and I want to go back to qualifying for something that you said when you said the, the, the journey or the roller coaster begins at discharge. Um, just to clarify, do you mean the physical recovery is lifelong or are you talking about something else when you say it's a roller coaster ride and it begins at discharge? I think, well, the physical aspect, obviously in the hospital, you know, there's mm -hmm. the acute care phase. Yeah, the, when I say roller coaster ride, I don't mean there is still physical aspect, of course, but it's also a lot of emotional and psychological of beginning to um, identify really the journey that you're on, the healing process, the recovery, and it's up and down. You know, it's tough in the beginning. It's not an easy road. And, and that's another place. And I think we all can also attest to this. It's hard for parents to let go of their kids to come to camp, especially <clears throat> after they've been in a burn unit, right? Exactly. It's really a difficult thing. But if we can <laughs> pry them loose, the, like Anita said, the parents are forever grateful. They don't understand the impact that it's going to have at the beginning. And then once they see the impact that it has on their kids, you know, they're grateful. But no, I think that roller coaster ride is both physical and psychological when you leave the burn unit. Um, and, and we're not just talking about the, the burn injured child, right? That's impacted. Oh, uh, no, everybody's impacted. The whole family is impacted. Mm -hmm. and, and the siblings, I mean, obviously there's a big impact there, you know, as far as what they're going through as well. But they're not burned. That doesn't matter. What, so, so what could a sibling possibly be going through? They're not the one that's burned physically. So what, what could siblings possibly be going through? And I'm pitching this out to the entire panel. So survivor guilt is big for parents, but it's also big for children. And children are sort of like the forgotten um, survivors in a family. But, um, you know, it's, it's taken us a while, but I think we're getting better at recognizing the whole family unit and how everybody is affected. And, 
you know, our siblings tell us, I mean, I've heard countless siblings say that, you know, they felt abandoned by their parents because their parents were at the hospital all the time. Um, you know, then when the, the burned sibling came home, it was, um, you know, there's just a lot of emotion there. I think for a lot of parents, you do the best you can, but siblings perceive in some cases where the child that was burned got treated differently, or they, um, they didn't have the same expectations put on them because they were hurt or, and the, the parents just try to make up for the fact that the kids got hurt. I mean, we could go on and debate this forever. Um, I think what camp does, especially for us, we have family camp for this, but it gives the families opportunities to know that other families, just like the kids who are camper age and go to camp, they get to meet other families who have experienced the same thing. And there's even less opportunity for them to come together than there are for the camper age kids. So for them to come together and see there are other families and for siblings to be able to talk to other siblings and you know that kind of thing. We started out just inviting camper aged kids and their families to family camp. And the last several years, we've invited adult survivors who had smaller camper aged children. And just this past year, um, one of the, the adult survivors said, you know, she said, I didn't know what I didn't know. She said, when I, we came to camp, she said, we came just thinking that it would be a fun weekend to go and our family to be together. She said, but, you know, she said, one of my children would not even be in the same room with me when I did my dressings or whatever. And it was at family camp after she had seen other children who had been burned and, and seen other families interact that they went back to their cabin and she asked her mom to see her burned legs. I mean, you know, those are the kinds of opportunities that just being together with other burn survivors bring and it organically happens. Those are the things we didn't even plan for. But um, just creating those opportunities for survivors to come and support other survivors, whether they be the parents, whether they be the survivor, whether they be the siblings, it just, you know, um, those people understand in a way that only other survivors can understand. And for many survivors, they really truly don't know what they need until it kind of is presented to them. And then they're so grateful that they get it um, and the impact it has on them, but they, they you know, don't start out re recognizing they need that connection. To um, what's so great about the camp environment and you guys have all alluded to it, is that I think, um, and I know sometimes when we talk about it, like, you know, when you're like in doing it, people are like, oh my God, you must sit around and just talk about feelings nonstop, like because of all <laughs> stuff, you know, like if you think about what we're talking about, people sometimes think like, oh, I don't, I don't know. It's too heavy. And it's like, man, we have a ball at camp. I'm like, I mean, first, we do first and foremost, we're having fun. I think it's the power of, of how those how the environment really sets you. So I think Daniel, you said it about the beers. It really like the stakes just get dropped so low, you know, and it just something about like laughing over sweating outside or laughing over food that you don't necessarily like, or the bug in the corner, you know, like all those things that happen when you take away so many distractions or somebody conquering their fear on the high ropes or not conquering their fear, but giving it a try and brushing a horse or falling in the lake. I mean, fill in the blank of things that happen. It just lowers that barrier to where you can get to the good stuff. And um, Daniel, you mentioned American Camp Association. They had an article not too long ago that was talking about where does camp happen? Like, does camp happen, you know, with these structured, intentional, we're going to debrief and talk about. And it was like, no, camp happens in those small moments, in those memories, like laughing over your bunk 
at 2 a.m. when your kids are supposed to be asleep or when somebody pours all the drinks into one thing and you have to drink it. It's like that stuff. And I think for people who've never had the opportunity, I didn't grow up going to camp. <laughs> Side story. One of my friends went and she got lice and all her stuffed animals got taken away. <laughs> and I didn't want to go to camp after that <laughs> because I couldn't imagine let go of my stuffed animals. But it's those things, you know, that happen and that you experience if you don't, you know, I didn't do that, but it's just, there's so much power when you can kind of, you can just get into a, a space where it's just, uh, you know, there's a lot of time to spend together. So I think I always forget that when we're talking about camp, when we talk about, I think, oh, I need to make sure people know we're, we're having fun. <laughs> we're having a ball. It's like there's a pie being thrown in somebody's face and, you know, all sorts of shenanigans that go on with it as well, which just adds to, you know, the fun of it all. Mm -hmm. Fun, fun with a purpose. That's it. You know, when we recruit, we, you know, I tell people all the time that, you know, I can, I can stand on my soapbox and I can tell you all about camp but there is just something that you cannot put into words. You actually have to experience burn camp. And I tell people all the time, you're going to work hard and you're going to be so tired at the end, but you're going to get so much more out of camp than you are giving. And I just can't, you just can't describe that to anybody. I mean, it, it, it for someone listening, it sounds like uh, a magical place. <laughs> uh, it, it does. Um, yes, we can give Disney a run for his money. I'll just say that. <laughs> I got burned as a child, you know, and I spent almost a year in the hospital. Uh, Daniel, how do you talk my mother? <laughs> no, no, you know, how do you talk my mother into allowing me to come to camp? That, that is the, one of the biggest challenges that I think we all have within all of our camps is convincing the parents. <clears throat> it's odd. I, I always say this, and this is not a laughing thing, but I have two types of parents. One, I have the type of parent who drops their kid off early and then comes late to pick up the parent <laughs> and doesn't contact me at all um, during the whole process. And then I have the other parent who contacts me five times a day asks for me to send pictures of their kid, what they're doing, what they eat for lunch, did they take their medication, um, and we have the full gamut of both, right? And those are two extremes. Um, and those are the ones that send their kids. I always tell people, you know, within our database, I have hundreds of burn survivor children who are eligible to attend camp. And yet I only have about 150 that go. And 150 is a lot of work to get 150 to go. Um, but still in that, there's so many conversations with parents in which they don't even entertain it. And I think sometimes it's about addressing the shame and the guilt and, sh and the questions that are there. Um, I think for a lot of parents to say, I know that your kid is going to be okay. And to say, sometimes it's going to be harder for you to let your kid go than for your kid to want to go. Because once your kid is there, they're not going to be crying and homesick. They're going to be having so much fun that they don't even, for they forget that they have families at home and that things are not always so much fun. Um, so I think sometimes it's about exposure. You know, I think a lot of us do different practices. Anita can talk about what she does within VR and, and what they've been able to do that to show someone a physical experience of what camp is. Some of us have preview days in which we allow families to come in early to see what camp is, shadow um, some of our campers. Um, but I think it's just addressing what is your biggest concern? What is the needs that you have? And how can I maybe, I probably don't want to um, uh, tell everyone that I do this, but maybe I'll do this for you guys. So there are times in which I am texting a parent. I might even slip a phone to a kid to say, what do I need to do to get your kid to come to camp that's going to make you feel comfortable? And sometimes it's just addressing some of those barriers. I go through the whole thing of, we are background check. Most of my volunteers are 30 to 40 years old, have their own kids that 
themselves. Um, they are doctors and nurses and firefighters or people who are respected in the community. They have been trained. They're mandated reporters. You know, I go through the whole gamut to let them feel secure that they're trusting them to important. We have a full medical team. We have a wellness team, a mental health team. Like we have all of these things that could support your child. Your kid's never alone with another adult. You know, we go through the policies hoping that that's going to give them comfort. But I think at the end of the day, what they really want to know is that by sending their kid to camp, they're doing the best thing for their kid. And that they, if they truly love and want to support and want to be that healing journey for that survivor, one of the best things they can do is sending them to a burn camp. And that's, and, and that's hard to argue. You can have reservations on all the other things, but when you really go and boil it down to it, it's, this is going to help your kid. And when you tell that to a parent, it's really hard to argue that. That's like trying to argue with a doctor to say, my kid doesn't need that surgery. And when you say, but it's going to make a huge difference and they're going to have a better quality of life, nine times out of 10, the parents would say, okay, you're right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is the PSA, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, for any parents that are, are listening uh, to this session, this episode tonight, because it is hard. You know, what parent doesn't feel guilty when their child gets hurt? <laughs> you know, and if, and if my mom sends me to camp, is she really saying she can't handle it? <laughs> yeah. So all of the, the, the layers and layers of things that, that happen. Uh, and I know one case where the parents dropped their kids off at camp and the parents would set up tents <laughs> and a tent site across camp until camp was over and they had a telescope. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, when we found out, we laughed on the one hand, but the other hand, how how unfortunate is that? How heavy is that? You know, the love is there, but it's like God, you gotta you gotta brave snakes and wet grass uh, because you do want the best for your for your child. Um, and there are um, a lot of camps across the world, um, and I know. Um, Mackenzie, you and Daniel are on the board for the IBC. I think you guys recruited uh, uh, Anita, I'm not sure. And, and Cindy, you've been doing the IAFF camp. And, and that's a specialized camp uh, of sorts. Um, are there any similarities or similar challenges to getting uh, kids to that camp, Cindy? I, I actually think it's even a little tougher because most of those kids have to fly in. So it's, they're coming from all over the United States and Canada, and they have to fly, you know, quite a ways to get to Washington, DC. So I think that's one of the challenges with that camp. Although I will, they're accompanied by one of the counselors from camp, so that does help. But I still think it's, it's tough to um, get the parents to let them go that far away. Okay. Yeah, I think it's the same for us. And, you know, I think one of the things that kind of alluding to some of the things Daniel shared, I think for us, we've seen some power in doing some of those family weekend programs because we've had quite a few parents say, I just wanted to come and meet y'all. I needed to see the people I was putting my child with and I needed to learn about who you were. And so I think that taking that has helped me and for us, like with our programs to learn how can we if we can't obviously do that, you know, you can't have a weekend every single time right before camp, but how can we provide some of that same type of, you know, introduction feel like, how can we personalize this experience? How can we, you know, how can somebody make sure that they feel like they know, you know, who I am and who these people are. So I think we're constantly learning and evolving, having um, hospital staff, you know, from the burn centers come. It's really great when parents can look and see somebody that, you know, maybe was a part of their child's treatment. And that's not obviously realistic every time, but even having them come visit and having some of those people on staff, I think really helps, but it's pretty, you know, it's pretty standard kind of across, like, especially from, a, you know, the North America stuff, I'd say uh, it's kind of the same thing for all camps is just figuring out how do you, you know, how do you best sell what camp is? And, you know, and we all can agree there's some kids who camp is just not for them. This is not, that's not the place that they're going to find that, you know, community or experience they're looking for. And that's great too, because we've all done things that we've tried and we found out 
this is not my jam. This is not for me. I'm going to find another lane to be in. So there's that as well. Um, but yeah, I just think it's one of those things that's, con we're, you know, we're constantly learning and evolving. How can we support families, but providing some of those same experiences, I think where families, you know, Dennis, we've talked about this in the past, um, how we, before we started some of our family programs, we recognized we were sending kids in homes that were maybe not prepared to have some of the conversations that we were having at camp and how um, that could be pretty unfair to parents who maybe weren't as prepared for a kid to want to engage in some honest conversation, because we all know, regardless of your family situation, there's a lot of guilt and shame and uh, lack of communication that can happen in your family. It's much easier to talk to strangers than it is your own people. And so um, I think that was some of the power that we found do it too, and doing some of the family programs. And I hope you know, doing, continuing to do these GFBF talks that people can listen in, you know, and it kind of plants some of those seeds for, for that as well. And, 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 and I want to be mindful too, because we're using acronyms and I know how to feel about acronyms. I think there ought to be a law that you can only use so many letters with an acronym. Um, and the IABC stands for International Association of Burn Camps and IAFF is the International Association of Firefighters host the burn camp so, so that people can understand what that what that means so they're not scratching their heads and what the hell uh, <laughs> and and, and um, there are some some dynamics there are some similarities and, and I know a conversation I had with my brother recently and um, you know my experience is over 50 years ago and uh, during the pandemic a, a lot of conversations occurred during that pandemic so, you know, people were just so uh, close <laughs> physically. And we talked about, um, he shared with me, he's a year older than I am. So he's a 15 year old. And he said, whenever he would come to the hospital to visit, that he would bring his baseball glove and my baseball glove and a ball. Because we played baseball the morning that I got burned that afternoon. We played baseball. And he said, even though he saw me laying there hooked up to life support and all these tubes and that from head to toe, he, he, he knew that. But there was some part of him that would bring the gloves and balls and say, today will be the day that we'll get back to normal and we'll play baseball. And this is a 15-year-old kid. And as he was sharing it with me, tears are running down my face, but he was also apologizing, saying, I know this sounds stupid. And it's like, y y yeah, no. <laughs> but um, for someone like to carry the weight of that 50 years before sharing it, man, how much of a benefit would it have been to him if he had attended burn camp as a sibling and talk to another brother. <laughs> you have to talk to me. Talk to another brother, and not have to carry the weight of that for so long. And I think that is the power of of, of burn camp. And um, based on my own experience, when you know I attended my first World Burn Conference uh, in Cindy, uh, and I and I I I I choose these words deliberately. And and Cindy saved my life. <laughs> And, and I, I use that term deliberately because I had only gone to one burn support group. <laughs> and that support group was making preparations to go to a burn conference. And I got invited and I went not knowing where the hell I was going. And I walked into a hotel with about 100 burn people in it. And it scared the hell out of me. And I literally um, was standing in the corner behind some chairs in the lobby. And, and Cindy and a couple of other people had to approach me just to hold my hand and hug. Mm -hmm. And here it was 50 years later. It's like, damn, shouldn't I be over this? <laughs> you know, all this time, shouldn't I be over it? Because I was a 30-year burn survivor then. So shouldn't I be over it? And um, camp can eliminate some of that. Camp can take some of the stuff out that heavy bucket that we're, mm. we're carrying. And for me personally, I recognize how valuable camp is. And Cindy, you can probably speak to this because you and I both were burned as kids and didn't have the the benefit or the option of a camp. And even if I was a kid that didn't do camp, because I'm a city boy, east side of Detroit, you know, uh, camp. 
Yeah. I watched the street like that, but knowing that I had an option would have made a difference. Whether I accessed it or not, just knowing. So I recognized the value of aftercare programs like Burn Camp because I didn't have it. <laughs> you know. Well, I think too, Dennis. I think you know when we're talking about this and we talk about the family too, and the siblings and everything. I think all of these programs, the family camps that we're doing, and we do one at Elisa and Rouge uh, Labor Day weekend, and it's powerful. And it started out, Anita, kind of like you guys. First, it was just adult survivors and their kids. And then we piloted several families with the kids being the survivor. And that um, community and that cohesiveness, the camaraderie between you know these people, it's powerful. And then they're able to leave and go back home and recognize that there are lots of families they can connect with each other and do a lot of really, really positive and powerful things. So yeah, I think camp just hands down is powerful. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, parking. We talk about the children's burn camp and we began talking about a family camp. Um, like for us to, to kind of talk a little bit about the difference, you know, do we have families there on water slides and all this other stuff, or is family camp a little different than exactly what is family camp? It's it's camp for families, and families do everything the campers would do if it were just campers. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of our activities focus so that families are doing things together. Um, families don't, like you said, Dennis, they don't necessarily sit down and talk to one another. Or in this day and time, the world is so fast, many families don't even sit down and share a meal together anymore. So we focus on the family unit when they're at family camp, but doing all the things that the kids do. They go to archery together, they go swimming together, they go down the slide together. Um, they do different craft projects together, um, you know, so, but at the same time, they have these opportunities to interact and to do these things with other families too. So um, you're having fun and interacting with these other families, but like everybody says, it's in an environment where the barriers are sort of lowered. So there's not necessarily that focus on, um, on sitting around in the circle. Now we do have time for that with the parents and the siblings and the, the survivors, but, um, but having those times where you're just having organic conversation, you know, and it really encourages that exchange also sets an example for how families can take that and take it back home for a family who might not have talked to one another, but it, it just sparked this curiosity or whatever to go back home and say, you know, so how was it for you? You know, the, I heard so-and-so and whatever's family talk about this. So what was it? you know, what was it like for you? So we're just planting seeds. Every time we have some kind of event that brings survivors and their families together, it plants a seed. Um, you know, we started out with Camp Celebrate and then we realized our adults needed something. So we had a big reunion. It's now our biggest event that we have every year. Then we had an adult retreat that is a more intimate time for people to come together. And then we said, you know, teens are a hard sell when it comes to just camp. So now we, <clears throat> yeah. So now we have what we call our teen adventure weekend and we take them on an adventure. You know, that's really not only do they get to be with other teenagers, you know, even in what we would consider the normal world, teenagers struggle, and then you add a burn injury on top of that, and it just makes it more complicated. So we, we have a camp just for kids, for teens, and we 
take them somewhere. So they have time to travel together and then they do these activities. You know, we took a group of kids up in the mountains of North Carolina and I never stopped to think how many kids there were on that bus that had never seen the mountains. Mm -hmm. You know, so even while we're helping them with their self-confidence and their self-esteem, we're also giving them life opportunities to experience things they would not otherwise get to experience. And then when we had family camp, now I'm thinking we need to have several family camps because I don't have enough space for all the families who want to come to family camp. So, um, you know, can I, Anita, I just want to jump in here real quick. I want to, when you talk about, um, you know, the, the camp environments, whether it's the adult camp, I mean, the teen camp, the kids, the family <clears throat> something that you said about society. And I feel like our kids and families in general need these programs even more now than when you and I were growing up, because I think societal, societal pressures, not only on the kids, but also on the parents is really tough right now. I mean, it's a really, really tough time. So I feel like these programs benefit them not only for the kids building self-confidence, but helping the parents and how they are able to relate, you know, their, their child's injury. Um, so to me, the societal pressures make it even more important that we do look at, you know, expanding our programs and, that camp is even more important now than it ever has been. Yeah, I, I would say to add on that, and Anita, you summed it up great by offering all these different types of camps that we all do. And I know today is about talking about burn camps for children, but like it works for children and it also works in every other, uh, other category that we talked about, the families, siblings, and research backs that, but not only research backs that, I think we see that like, the popular thing that I do, this is too much information for everyone, um, but on my first date with someone, I will take them to a museum, I will take them bowling, I will do an activity with them. Why? Is because that is less pressure for me to get to know them when we're doing a fun recreational thing, then I really get to know who they are without the pressure of us sitting across each other, judging each other, worried about what I'm going to say, worry about the same thing. The same format, the same idea goes with the camp populations. And I love the title that you did. This is fun with a purpose. Is that what Anita described though was that each of the purposes for each of those camps are going to be different. And what you may be focusing on for a kid's camp may be different than what you want to do for your adult camp. And you know, I really encourage people out there who are listening from other camps is they look at that and they take that intentionality and say, what is my mission for camp? What are the things that I want to see and how do I define success by what that is? And for me, like I say, these are five things I want to happen at camp. camp. I want my kids to be safe. I want my kids to have this. I want my kids to have that. For the adults, I might focus on some deeper level firm related conversational things that I want them to walk away with. So I really encourage people to always think about one, if you're attending a camp, what do you want to get from that? And then two, if you're facilitating a camp, what are you hoping to give? And not only to the campers, but to the volunteers, to the families back home, all those things. And, 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 you know, I've been a nurse for over 30 plus years. And I will say that all the things that I have learned about being a better burn nurse, I learned from my patients and their families. And so I think it's important for everybody to realize that as much as we support or me without a burn injury, um, support my survivors and their families and that kind of thing, I feel like it's my job to bring all those different survivors and families together so they can support one another because they have walked the walk and they've talked the talk so they can support one another in a way that I cannot. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that's what all of this is about. It's what aftercare is about. It's helping to bring 
age appropriate, interest appropriate, however you want to put it, but any and all opportunities for survivors to be together is going to have tremendous impact. And why not have fun at camp while you're doing it? I mean. <laughs> and, and, and we've all heard the stories about uh, buying your kid this wonderful present, Christmas present, and they spend more time playing with the box. The box, exactly. <laughs> and, and I think it's so important that these programs exist that we hear what people are saying because we can design as many programs and activities as we want. But at the end of the day, um, uh, piggybacking what Daniel said, are we providing the person we're serving with what they need? And, mm -hmm. uh, and I remember one of the things that stuck out with me over the dozens of camps I've had the privilege of being involved with, um, we were having a barbecue and, uh, and we're sitting eating hamburgers and hot dogs. And I'm talking to one of the kids and the kid got burned because he was involved in gang activity and you know there was somebody firebombed the place. So he, he didn't know how to ride a bike, but he knew how to hotwire a car. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is who the kid was. And he learned how to ride a bike at camp. He had never been in a swimming pool before. He not only got in a swimming pool, but he learned how to swim. In the first couple of days, he was still a thug, you know, but he had to start catching himself because he was laughing and having fun. And he had oh, this is not this is not cool. And it was uh, the night before the end of camp. And I was asked and I say, wow, I say, man, you learned a lot of stuff this week and you were involved in everything. You had a blast. What, what was the highlight for you this week? And you know what this kid told me? He told me, he said, Mr. Dennis, I could not believe that we got three meals a day and we could eat as much as we want. You know, it, I mean, I did not see that coming. You know, of all this stuff that happened, it was the basics for him, <laughs> you know. And would we have thought that? Would I have thought that? No, I wouldn't. But I think just being people-centered and hearing what people need and, and, and needing those needs, I think that response really sums it up. It's not always what we think on the surface. It's just something that can be just so simple. He got to eat three meals a day and could eat as much as he wanted because that's not where he came from. And it's like, wow, <laughs> you know, wow. But his need was met. The bike riding was cool. The pool was cool, but he got to eat. And he, he did not experience any hunger pains that week. And that was, and that was huge. And um, I'm just hoping this conversation has resonated with somebody. If there's one mom or dad out there <laughs> who picks up the telephone or gets online to look for a burn camp to get involved in, and this was time well spent. And what I want to do is take a, a couple of minutes and, and give each of you an opportunity to share some words of wisdom before we, we end this session, because this was a really fast hour. <laughs> it really oh, it was. has been. That's true. Yeah, and we'll, and we'll start with uh, Daniel. Uh, any words of wisdom you'd like to share? Ugh. You, you got me stumped on two parts, Dennis. One, words of wisdom, and then two, having to follow up that story about that, that, sur that survivor at camp. Um, that was uh, very heartfelt and hit so close to home in terms of so many of the survivors that we see. Um, I, think we, I think we all have summed up some really good points of the benefits of camp, and um, it's really hard to describe what camp is unless you get to see it. So whether you are sending your child to camp or thinking about sending your child to camp or whether you're thinking about getting involved in volunteering or whether you are past the volunteer stages and you wanna support, there's a lot of need financially for burn camps to make them possible. So whoever's listening, whoever you are, um, see the value in burn camps, get involved in some capacity, volunteering, sending your kid or donating to a local burn camp nearby. He does some amazing PSAs. Uh, Anita. <laughs> you know, um, we could, you know, doing our little PSAs, I mean, it's hard to put it into words. I mean, like I said, I think if you have never um, participated in camp, whether you're interested in volunteering, whether you're a, an adult who's who had a burn injury, who... Um, 
maybe didn't get the opportunity to go to camp. I think there's much to be said for finding a camp and volunteering um, for parents out there who are um, afraid or nervous about sending your kids to camp. Um, I, I just can't say enough how it's probably one of the most valuable things you could do for your child. Um, just to give a short anecdotal thing, we had a kid who had grown up coming to burn camp and it was his senior year and his graduation was during camp. And he told his mom he was not going to go to graduation, he was coming to camp. Now, as a mom, that had to be devastating. And she was just, she knew how much he valued his camp family and his experience at camp. So she was big enough to say, okay, you know, you don't have to walk, but she was devastated. So I just called her up and I said, well, bring his camp a gown and we'll have graduation at camp. So all the seniors who were graduating that year brought their cap and gown. We played pomp and circumstance. Our medical director presented their diplomas. We had graduation at camp, but that's just how impactful the experience of camp is for kids who have been burned. To give up your high school graduation, to be at camp and not miss it, enough said. Drop the mic. <laughs> Drop the mic and, and, and send the paper up. <laughs> I would say as far as um, words of wisdom, just again, camp will change your life, whether you're a child or a volunteer or an adult, it'll absolutely change your life. And as Anita said, when I first started doing camp, it totally changed my mentality as a nurse and going back into the burn unit and working, it just, it was so impactful on me as a volunteer. So I just say, you know, to the parents, let your kids go to camp. It'll make a difference, not only for them, but for you as well. If you're an adult and you wanna volunteer, step up. It's probably one of the best things in life is to volunteer at Burn Camp. No, who, who can say no to that, right? That's right. <laughs> um, Mackenzie, you wanna bring this to a Christian? I would love to. I just wanna take a moment too and just acknowledge the great work that each of these people have done. Instrumental people don't, don't be offended at my old comment, the what wisdom, but, but each of you truly and Daniel, I'm including you in this because I've heard your name too, but there are people I have met across this country who have spoken many of your names on the impact that you've made in their life and their journey. And so that's really important to acknowledge and thank you guys for your life's work because you could choose to do just about anything and you'd be good at it. And this is what you've chosen to dedicate your time and energy too. And I just want to acknowledge that and hold space for you guys because I looked up to each and every one of you and I feel privileged and honored to be just in this community alongside such great people. I think for me, what really sums this up is I, at one of our family programs, there was a, a, a mom of young kids who had a very, the, the son had a very recent injury. He was like probably three or four, way too young for camp. And they were really struggling and weren't really sure what to do. And for that mom, we had so many great conversations. And one of them, she was able to see one of our kids who'd been coming to camp for a long time. He's 17, 18, graduating out. And one of the things she said that stuck to me was this weekend, I learned what was possible for my son. And I, you know, for me, that is the power of the work that we do, because for her to find hope in that moment and see that there is a future beyond something that I think we all know is a future, but to really see it in person, um, there's so much value and power in that. And I think that's what we all hope the work that we get to do and that people take away from that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, for me personally, you know, thank each of you. Um, because of the friendships and the associations I have with, with you guys on, on this call, you have allowed me to be a child again without the heaviness of that loneliness. And, um, and I could never say thank you enough, you know, and it may seem insignificant to people, but the loneliness was the most difficult part of my journey, <laughs> you know, but stepping, stumbling into this community and making these connections. Um, I've really been allowed to, revisit some of that time and not be alone. And that is huge for me. 
could never, I could never say thank you enough. And on behalf of the Georgia Firefighters Burn Foundation um, and those we serve, we'd like to say thank you for sharing a little time and space this evening. And for all of those thousands of people out there listening <laughs> to this episode, uh, we appreciate you. And, uh, and it's not just about kids, like you said, Daniel. It's about anyone who's in the burn community and struggling. There's support available for all of us. And just not be afraid to ask for help. And with that, I will let you guys get into your evening. And thank you all so, so very much. Toodles. Love you guys. Thank you.